Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm going to be your facilitator today. My name is Joanne War. I'm a senior researcher at the National Centre for Vocational Education um, um, Research. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're meeting, which for me is Ghana country, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So today we are using the Zoom platform. If you're not too familiar with that, there's a couple of buttons that might be useful to you throughout the presentation. On the bottom left-hand side, you have your audio settings. So if you're having trouble hearing, uh, you can um, look in there to adjust your settings. And the other button you might need is right in the middle there, the question and answer button. If you want to send um, me or the panel any questions throughout the, the presentation, just open that one up and type in your question. And that will come through to us in the back end and we'll be able to get to those questions uh, after the panel discussion. So over the next 15 minutes, I'll be introducing the research that uh, me and my team conducted and explain our results and discuss some of the possible implications of those results. And that will reflect what's published in the research report, which is currently available to download on the NCBER website. So broadly speaking, this research delves into the question of student choice. We're looking at the decisions young people are making as they complete and leave school. Over you know, the last 20 years, we've seen more young people staying in school until year 12, and that's been encouraged deliberately through school leaving policies designed to ensure students are either working or learning and not falling into inactivity straight after secondary school. And this research specifically arose out of a curiosity of what we see in this chart here. So we, uh, we see it, it um, looks at 15 to 19 year olds enrolled the, uh, in apprenticeships and university, uh, the university students in the dark blue and the apprenticeships in the purple. And that we can see the proportion of young people going to university has been increasing. And we know that between 2012 and 17, the university sector operated under what was called the demand driven system where student funding was uncapped and access was expanded. And they, there was a responding increase in the number of young people enrolling in undergraduate programs. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, across that same period, we saw that youth apprenticeship participation has declined a little um, with a brief uptick uh, heading into the COVID period. And that uh, there was a um, kind of uh, opposite but parallel change to the university enrolments at that time. Um, unfortunately, at the time of this research, we did not have access to the 2022 university enrolment figures. So all of our, um, our charts and data in the report will stop at the 2021 period, but we can see that there's some change coming into the COVID um, area. So and a, con a concern or assumption that sometimes has risen out of this phenomenon is thinking about whether this increase in university attendance amongst young people has worked to reduce the pool of, of available people to do apprenticeships. So one analysis of the demand driven system showed that many of the additional students attracted to university were lower income, lower academically performing young people who traditionally have been the ones to choose apprenticeships. Uh, so in simple you know, numerical terms, if there are more 19 year olds going off to university, there are, that leaves fewer of them to choose apprenticeships and perhaps the type of young people remaining in that pool are not as suited to apprenticeships as they had been in the past. Uh, so when we approach this problem as researchers, um, we recognise it would be very difficult for us to look at that pool of uh, available, you know, people who are available to do apprentices. That's quite a, a large pool and there's, there's not an easy data set that allows us to access um, you know, the characteristics of those young people. However, what we could do was use the data we do have access to to look at the characteristics of apprenticeship commences and compare those characteristics to those who choose to go to university and then look at that across time. So our research questions for this project were firstly, what are the characteristics of apprentices compared to university students now? And secondly, how have the characteristics of apprentices changed relative to university commences across um, the last 20 years or so. And just a note that 
in this research and today when I'm speaking, when I use the term apprenticeships, it refers to both trade and non-trade apprentices, so traineeships included. For the full detail of the analysis and our statistical models, you can um, look to our report, but today I'm going to try and speak really in lay terms about the, what we did and the results. Um, so we decided to use the um, data from the Longitudinal Survey of Australian Youth, the LSA, and that's um, a survey that tracks youth from young Australians over 10 years from age 15 to 25 as they move through school to further study, work and beyond. And that survey data really provides the best view of young people's academic achievement and eventual work and educational destinations. Uh, so because we wanted to look across time, we went back um, and picked out four LSA cohorts to include in this study, starting with Y03, which means they started when they were 15 years old in 2003, and 2006, 2009, and 2015. Unfortunately, there was no uh, cohort in 2012, so we do have a bit of a, a double the length um, gap between 09 and 15 when we look across trends. Um, we decided to look at, we had to pick an age to, to which we were going to compare these two groups and we decided 19 years old was the best, was the best age um, to focus on and that's for a few different reasons. Firstly, because the school leavers, um, you know, at 19, they're most likely to have finished their secondary school education and are starting to look at what they're doing next and those school leavers represent uh, what we most people would consider the new supply of future workers. So post school choices are an important indicator of that future workforce skills supply. And those aged under 20 also represent the dominant share of university undergraduate commencement. So this is when most young people are choosing to start university. And thirdly, the LSA on a practical level is collected until age 25, but we do see participant drop by out as young people age. And the responses tend to skew towards those who've um, chosen university education. So as we get older, we see there are fewer and fewer apprentice respondents. Um, and it just, it, we aren't able to get a meaningful, meaningful comparison with such a small group. So using that, data and looking at age 19, my two data analysts on this project developed two statistical models to compare the characteristics. So the first model would look at characteristics of young people choosing apprenticeships compared to those choosing university in 2019, which is when the year 2015 cohort were 19 years old. And the second model would then add a time element, a time variable into the model and compare the change in characteristics in young people choosing apprenticeships and university across time. So this is the list of the variables that we included in our model um, and the decision around which variables to look at in comparing young people was based on what had previously been revealed as important to pathway selection. For example, school achievement and socioeconomic status. And then we uh, based we did face some other restrictions in what we could look at, um, some variables we weren't able to use in the model simply because there weren't enough respondents in that category to gain any meaningful um, results. So for example, we wanted to look at people with disability, but there just weren't enough respondents uh, to be able to use them in this model. Uh, so the results, what did we find? So in 2019, Students who were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, who were male, who spoke English at home, who were Australian or first generation Australian, and who attended government schools were more likely to choose an apprenticeship than to choose to go to university. And that's when they were at age 19. And note that these effects are all independent of each other. So all other characteristics being held the same, males were about four times more likely than females to choose an apprenticeship than university. And that's how we interpret those figures all the way around that graphic. So those speaking English at home were about two times more likely than non-English speaking at home to choose a, an apprenticeship over university. Uh, 
And young people with higher maths and higher reading achievement and higher socioeconomic status were more likely than lower achievers and lower income youth to choose university than to choose apprenticeships. So this, these results paint us a picture of kind of the stereotypical young person in 2019, more inclined to choose apprenticeships than to go to university. And it's likely a pretty familiar picture. So the next model we use to look at a comparison across time to see if any of those characteristics have changed since 2007 when our first cohort was 19 years old. Um, so we actually found that there were quite very few variables that had a significant uh, result and had any change between 2019 and the other three time periods that we looked at. Uh, the exact figures here are less important because it can be, get quite complex once you start getting into it, but the direction of the trend is what's important to look at. So the green arrows on the end, on the right-hand side of that graphic, stand against the variables that showed an increasing likelihood of choosing an apprenticeship over university across that period. So we can say that Australian-born youth became more likely than foreign-born youth to choose an apprenticeship than to go to university. And that in turn is true for first generation Australians when compared to foreign born Australians. The other group that became more likely to choose an apprenticeship than go to uni, but um, only more recently was youth with higher reading achievement. Uh, meanwhile, with the red arrows, those who speak English at home became less likely to choose an apprenticeship than to go to university compared to those speaking a language other than English at home. And the same was true for Catholic school attendees compared to independent school attendees. So the gap in likelihood to take up an apprenticeship has narrowed for those groups. But just as interesting and perhaps really interesting for this study uh, were the student characteristics and variables that were not associated with any change likelihood of commencing an apprenticeship instead of university across those periods, time periods. So our model found no change in likelihood by gender, by Indigenous status, by geographic location, by maths achievement, or between the government and independent school sectors. So while those, um, you know, the findings that some things haven't budged at all um, might be surprising, it's important to remember that uh, a few things about this study. It's firstly, we have to remember that these models were looking at relative change. So we're not saying that there has been no increase in, for example, Indigenous um, people choosing uh, apprenticeships because we know that has happened. If we look at the VET data, the, the apprentice and trainee collection, we can see that the share, the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples choosing apprenticeships has doubled in that across that same period. But this model is looking at relative to those choosing university. So while we might see little change in the characteristics, it's little relevant, uh, uh, relative change. Um, also, we need to remember that there are a lot of apprentices and university students that were not included in this model because they were older than 19. So a little more than half of apprentices commence after age 19 these days. And most especially we see that's the case for uh, some equity groups like females and indigenous peoples. Um, and in this study, due to the way that the LSA data is collected, we weren't able to tease apart the trade and non-trade apprenticeships. And if we were able to do that, we might have been uh, able to see a little more nuance in how the variables and characteristics have changed across time. For example, gender might have been more significant. Um, and as always, for any kind of logistic like regression uh, analysis, we have to remember that what we're seeing in the results are trends and correlations, not necessarily causation. And uh, obviously, you know, it's a temptation to read in what we see, but um, sometimes there's other effects that we need to consider. So given the largely consistent profile of young people choosing to undertake an apprenticeship since 2007, it seems that, you know, some of the concern about university access impacting the availability of young people for apprenticeships might be unwarranted. Um, you know, six, if about 60% of young people are entering university by the age of 22, which is what the Productivity Commission reported in 2019, 
there's still about 40% of young people available to form that pool of potential apprentices, which is a lot of people. Um, research into career pathways for young people tell us that those who aspire to attend university are unlikely to be persuaded into an apprenticeship. And similarly, that young people who aspire to an apprenticeship hold very specific ambitions for an occupation and are unlikely to be persuaded into university. So knowing this, um, it may be more productive for interventions or um, initiatives to focus on attracting those young people who have no clear aspiration to attend university or those with poor access to information about post-school pathways and um, promoting that for them to consider apprenticeships or uh, methods of reaching students before they form fixed ideas about what they'd like to do after their secondary schooling. And we've seen that policy intervention can attract young people to apprenticeships, and that's partly because apprenticeships aren't just about student choice in a vacuum. It's driven by the availability of apprenticeships. So employers play a large part in, you know, how many young people can take up an apprenticeship. And most recently, we saw an increase in apprenticeship commencements, and that flowed out of the Commonwealth's Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Wage Subsidy. And that was implemented during COVID to encourage the uptake of apprenticeships during the you know, COVID and the, the economic downturn that was a result of that. And as a result of that, um, you know, it was a 50% wage subsidy. In response to that, we saw that apprentice commencements rose about 30% between 2020 and 2022. So that's quite a significant increase. And this also suggests that there is a supply of apprentices to meet rising demand. Um, so a key question would seem to be um, what would work to sustain this leap in, in commencements, this increase in commencements? And then for young people, what would work best for them to give them access to personalised, informed career guidance that places them on the pathway that best suits them without prejudice? And an apprenticeship remains an excellent opportunity if employers are able to offer high quality work and learning experiences in partnership with their training organisations. And our findings have shown that perhaps we don't need to hold too much anxiety about young people all disappearing into university, but there is still work to do, both with young people and employers to make apprenticeships an attractive choice for those who um, want to, uh, uh, considering their options. Um, and additionally, there's a lot of um, opportunities for research to illuminate the best ways that this can be achieved. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in a tertiary education um, sector and apprenticeship space for us to consider. And so to help me expand on those considerations today, we're joined by four expert guests. I'd like to now introduce our panel members. First, I have um, Peter Skujans, Senior Policy and Insights Manager at the Apprenticeship Employment Network, and Adrian Neuenhaus, uh, Commissioner at Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, Ben Barden, CEO of the National Australian Apprenticeships Association, and Diane Dayhew, who's the CEO of the National Apprenticeship Employment Network. So welcome all of you. I have no doubt you're all champing at the bit to say your piece. So let me kick off with a question to you first, Adrienne. Uh, recently, we saw that the um, final report of the Australian Universities Accord was released. Uh, we saw that there were some targets outlined again for VET and for higher education. Uh, do you see any links between that report and the findings of our research? Oh, thanks, Jo. Yes, it might have been called the Australian Universities Accord, but it had a lot to say about tertiary education and it also had a lot to say about VET. Um, it, its central tenant is very much about skills growth through equity and greater levels of participation across higher education and across VET. Look, and it starts with this, the, the, the data we've all seen from Jobs and Skills Australia and Productivity Commission, similar things that in the next decade, 90% of new jobs will require some form of post-skill qualification. So the very central target, and it's a mighty one, um, that the Accord has set is that it wants to lift the tertiary, so VET and higher ed, attainment rate of all working age people with at least a Cert 3 or above from the current 60% to the at least 80% by 
by 2050. Now, just to put that in context, I've got a, a higher red number, but I haven't got a vet num equivalent vet number. So to go from 60% now to 80% now just in higher ed would mean an increase from 860,000 current Commonwealth supported places, which is effectively mostly undergraduate and a bit of postgraduate, to 1.8 million by 2050. That's quite colossal and mm. seeing similar growth rate, not quite as high, but a similar growth rate in the VET system. Um, but I don't know, based on the findings that we've just talked about from the NCEVR um, and the Accord um, paper uh, report acknowledges this, um, you know, the pa patterns of representation and underrepresentation in VET and in higher ed are deeply entrenched. Like I'm just going to talk a little bit from a higher education perspective because I know that Peter and Ben and, and you know, Peter particularly will, will talk about some of the VET equity issues in VET. Um, the sort of the move to mass higher education started in the mid 70s when you know they took away all the fees, but that was very much a um, open the door and everyone will come. Well, people did come between the night from the night, mid 1970s onwards, but higher education didn't expand in the way that um, it might have done. And public actual public policy intervention, like some of the stuff Joe you just talked about towards the end of your presentation around equity and participation. Um, and again, I'm talking more higher ed, but it did was also in, in VET at the time, um, started with things like a fair chance for all, which was in 1990, and that was part of the Dawkins reforms. So not only, you know, Daw Dawkins is remembered for merging universities and creating new universities, but there was a, quite a powerful fair chance for all public policy that started to think about equity, and it was through that paper that we started to think about the equity groups we now talk about and how to define them, how to measure them, how to track. That all came through from the work starting with a fair chance for all. And then as summarized in the report, we had the Bradley Review in 2008 and the Bradley Review set pretty solid attainment targets across those equity groups, low SES, First Nations, rural and regional um, and people with disabilities um, and for attainment targets to 2020. So 2020 came and gone. Um, we did have COVID, which sort of messed it around a bit, but not really. Um, and some of those targets were met, but a lot weren't. And it was the same patterns. So it's the same patterns of disadvantage. It's the same patterns of rural and regional in particular, but also out of, out of metropolitan, where, where the attainment targets from the Bradley Review were not met also jurisdictional and state-based differences. So the Accord is talking about, again, a lot of strategies, student standard strategies, more directed and pur purposeful funding to address low participation. And while we have seen many programs over the years that have increased participation, I still wonder how systemic they are. And some of the, you know, the sort of research that you're talking about, Joe, we still need to delve, in my view, a lot deeper into this. Um, because my view is I think we're still just making a dent at the side and we're not still not really seeing sustained change, particularly with some of the characteristics you've just talked about. And also, there's a lot of very recent trends emerging that I find quite worrying. So although, Joe, you talked about um, school outcomes, they're actually softening. So school retur retention is going down, particularly in the public school system. Um, demand across tertiary education is, has also softened. Now, that could be counter-cyclical with, you know, high, high employment and things like that, but there's something going on there too. Um, and so I just, I just wonder whether some of these other patterns we've seen, you know, PISA results, all that stuff in the school system, um, that we're still a fair way off the, um, the, you know, really changing patterns of social mobility in Australia. So I'm going to leave it there because other people want to talk and then hopefully there'll be heaps of questions and we can delve more into it. Thanks. That's fantastic start, Adrian. Thank you. And yes, it, you know, it is worth pointing out that we do see those same um, targets and challenges coming up um, repeatedly in these reports. 
Um, and Peter, I'm wondering if um, you have anything to, to add on that. We have this focus again on equity targets, as Adrienne said, on the in the university's accord. And there have been efforts for many years to shift the participation of equity groups in apprenticeships as well. Um, and that this research and other research has sometimes shown that there's very little gain in some of those groups. Why do you think it's been so difficult to affect lasting change in participation mm -hmm. for, for some equity groups? Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of different um, pieces coming together with this. And I think across the research and the data definitely shows, as um, Adrian has also said, very little shift over time in a lot of our priority cohorts and equity groups. Um, you know, we do need to change our strategies to be able to target these different groups. What we've been doing hasn't been working. So I think I'll, I'll start off by saying that. I think one of the things in the apprenticeship system that we need to be really mindful of um, is the relationship with the employer. Now, I know, um, Joe, that you touched on this in your presentation as well, um, but ultimately it is up to an employer to decide who they're hiring into their apprenticeship role. So you can have the most diverse and equitable pool of potential apprentices um, who are willing to go into these roles, but if the employers aren't willing to hire those people into the apprenticeship role, we're not going to make a dent in our um, diversity of our commencements. And that's something that I think we really need to, to be mindful of that is different in apprenticeships um, compared to higher education or VET um, programs more generally as well. Um, now, you know, as the data is showing over time, we're really not seeing a lot of change across these groups. Um, and I think, you know, as Adrian has said very clearly, a lot of the policies that we've implemented over time really haven't got to the bottom of trying to drive change um, across a lot of these equity groups at all. Um, you know, we've had quite a lot of discussions um, as a, a group leading into this webinar about some of the different kind of blunt instruments of policy um, that we've tried to implement to make some of these changes, particularly in the apprenticeships system around um, incentives and wage subsidies and those kinds of things, where we're really seeing an uplift in overall uh, commencements and training activity, but not necessarily in the types of uh, priority groups that we're really trying to target with some of these um, particular um, initiatives. One thing we are seeing in the data, um, which um, is, is quite positive, um, in Victoria, the Major Project Skills Guarantee does mandate um, female trade apprentice hours. Um, and uh, that really has seen an uplift over time, which has been sustained um, in our participation rates of female trade apprentices. Now it's from an extremely low level um, and the uplift is only in those projects um, that are under that. But of course, we are seeing the rollout of the Australian Skills Guarantee um, coming up. And so that's something that we'd be really looking um, to see what type of impact that can make. Where we're going to see, I think, some of our challenges here is, you know, it's all well and good to say that there are potentially a pool of apprentices out there to do this, um, but we don't know what those levels look like. There may be a lot of women out there who are willing to come into these trade apprenticeship programs if employers are offering them, but we don't really know what that level looks like because we've never been in a situation before where there's been really high demand for those particular cohorts. So I think um, from that kind of policy perspective, we do need to, to balance out how we're managing this, making sure that we are putting, um, you know, programs in place that are driving genuine and sustained change um, rather than just trying to make, you know, quick um, short-term impacts um, that revert once that policy is no longer in place. But we also do need to make sure that we do have um, that long-term pipeline of uh, potential apprentices um, and, you know, in the university and the broader vet sector as well, that long-term pipeline um, of uh, potential students who are willing to go into those roles as well. Um, so I think I know that we've got a few other people who want to talk a lot about the employer perspective as well, but I think I'll just wrap up um, quickly by saying that we do in the apprenticeship space need to look both at the apprentice and the employer element, um, which of course can be a lot more complex um, than some of our other um, more student focused areas as well. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Absolutely. It's a it's a complex relationship. And um, as you say, the, the broad strokes with that can be a blunt instrument, whereas we, what we see is that each situation requires its own nuanced um, strategy or initiative to address it. Um, ben, I'll pass to you next. Um, this Our analysis that we did in this research didn't detect much change in the profile of apprentices compared to university students. Did that surprise you? Um, thanks, Joe. Well, no, it didn't actually. I mean, I think broadly speaking, when you have a look um, and you've identified that where where there are minor changes, but broadly speaking, the types of people who do apprenticeship hasn't changed much, and the types of people who do 
uh, university, go to university hasn't changed much the characteristics underneath, notwithstanding the Productivity Commission report that you refer to. Um, what I would say, though, <clears throat> is that there is a cohort of people who could do either. Um, and electrical apprentices are often um, uh, making a very active choice um, between whether they do an apprenticeship or whether they go to university and do engineering. Um, uh, and um, they generally do have the characteristics of um, the cohort that go to uh, that go to university, that their maths is good, has to be good to, to finish the apprenticeship. Their reading's generally um, pretty high. So we can't see in the data um, those that could do either. Um, we also don't see in the data those students um, that uh, apply for an apprenticeship but don't get one um, and where they go next, whether they uh, go to university or whether they um, uh, become part of the not uh, in, in education, employment or training. Um, uh, the LSA data also didn't give us much visibility of the students who went on to do some other form of VET um, qualification. And that's at a, uh, an all time high with uh, fee free TAFE happening at the moment. There's about 1.1 million people in Australia at the moment who are doing some form of publicly funded VET out of 4.1 million students that use the VET system each year. Um, so um, the LSA data didn't really give us that because they, uh, that wasn't that wasn't examined. Um, and uh, you know, anecdotally, we know that there are a number of university students who drop out and then take up an apprenticeship, so um, or complete their apprenticeship, uh, complete their university study, and and take up an apprenticeship. And the LSA data didn't really give us visibility of that. Um, I think one of the challenges for, for this, and there was a lot of great discussion in the paper, and I, I wanted to thank the team for their forbearance as we, as we asked difficult questions uh, on a limited data set, but um, the 2019 LSA data for apprentices, uh, you know, it, it had only 316 respondents, so that's a very small sample size in a year where there were about 85,000 in that cohort who went on to, uh, to start an apprenticeship. And, and it could be that the way that it's sampled through phones and online probably doesn't suit apprentices are not allowed to use their phone at work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think there are some um, limitations to what can be inferred, but I agree um, the, broad, the broad finding that there is a, a correlation, but that causation is difficult to slate back to um, particular factors really represents the complex interplay of uh, employer choice, who they're offering apprenticeships to, and the fact that the under 19, um, 19 and under cohort is only 35% of the total apprenticeship cohort once you take um, school-based apprentices out. So, um, you know, so we really are talking about just over a third of people start an apprenticeship at 19. And that and that by by age nineteen, and that really does bear some some further research. So I'll stop there. <laughs> no, no, that that's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, so Diane, the research revealed little change in apprenticeship characteristics, uh, but Ben's acknowledging that there's there were limitations on that research, and that changes may be occurring that we aren't able to observe. Um, so from the employer side, uh, from your point of view, do you see that employers are actively seeking different types, uh, different characteristics in their apprentices compared to in the past? Mm. Um, thanks, Joanne. And thanks to all of the guests here. As you can see, we all love talking about <laughs> apprenticeships and um, we could they, they are very complex. Um, it's kind of unfair in some ways to compare a university pathway to an apprenticeship pathway because the effective difference is, is that it's it's you need to have a job as an apprentice um, as part of your training contract um, and it's a different type of pursuit if you think of school as a community um, and university as a community it's almost a seamless kind of pathway and it's just kind of a safe choice in some ways. And uh, there's a lot of, there can be peer encouragement to go off to university. There can be parent encouragement, cultural background encouragement, reinforcement, school promotions, early entry offers to um, young people to, to go straight from school into university. Um, to make the choice of doing an apprenticeship or a traineeship, it's, 
it's an individual pursuit. Uh, you, you, you need to be that single person that has the job, the training provider organised and the pathway and the choice of what you're going to do when you finish um, that traineeship. So it is a, a completely um, different choice and uh, and so and there are many many things that I could discuss here, but I guess um, in terms of choices, we are seeing more women in trades being and particularly in mature age um, coming into the apprenticeship sector, particularly through group training. Um, group training organisations respond to initiatives and um, incentivisation from state government programs and each other as well. Um, and the promotion of women in trades is really strong. Uh, and I think if you have been to any award ceremonies for traineeships and apprenticeships over the last years, <laughs> you will see the dominance of women wi winning those awards, which is um, uh, uh, something to con consider and discuss. I think um, we are seeing more non-government schools promoting um, the, the pathway of an apprenticeship or a traineeship after school that we're just, we're starting to see the seeds of, well, an ATAR is only for a student that um, that is going into university straight after school. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something that you choose if you're making the university choice, but there are traineeships and apprenticeships on offer. So we're seeing more options, but one of the considerations to make for um, school-based apprenticeships, which we've made really good headway through um, group training organisations, um, particularly in, in government schools, we have been seeing that more non-government schools are receiving of interest from kids in year 10, I want to do a school-based apprenticeship but um, then policy changes can affect that and the recent um, change in the incentives program made it much more difficult to promote um, employers to take on a school-based apprentice. So therefore that momentum is impacted. So um, yeah, there's, there's, there are changes in, you know, the employers will target different sectors and different types of apprentices and trainees depending on demand and uh, renewable energy and allied health is are two really big areas that are becoming a key focus for our sector, for our employers in group training. I don't want to talk too much, so I'll wait for my next question to say more, <laughs> No, no, thank you. That's, um, yeah, really interesting. Um, do we think that we'll ever get away from that um, socio-cultural influence of um, the perception of university as being the place to go. Do, can we ever counter that? Anyone in the panel would like to take that one up? <laughs> oh, look, I'll start. <laughs> um, I would like to think yes. Um, and I just saw the question that's in the Q&A chat, which mm. was about the term apprenticeship and gender. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think that, you know, comes together that we have, and, and I think Peter brought it out in her response as well, we have a lot to think about in terms of how we describe things to people, young people, mid-20s. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm taken by what Ben said around, you know, mature age people going to do apprenticeships, people in the older because they understand things more in a different way to say that the younger cohorts where there are different types of influences, as Diane talked about a little, that mean that language and all of those things come together that that mean that there are well back back to what I said in my thing that that, that 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 people think in a particular way they've got influence in a particular way and it just recreates the norm rather than mm. breaking it down. So, like the question says about you know is apprentice the right word? <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> one since some many people are so you know tied up with that word apprentice. Um, but are there are there things even deeply as language that means that we end up in these stereotype patterns? Mm. Yeah, and yeah. picking up on that, the, one of the things that was interesting when I was looking at the data about um, the age at commencement recently, um, uh, uh, in 2022, 60% of apprentices were actually trainees. Uh, so that yeah. term Australian apprentice um, uh, is, is uh, somewhat of a misnomer. And employers, interestingly, 
um, are prepared to offer traineeships to uh, people who are 21 and older much more readily than they were um, uh, in 2015 or 2016. And, uh, and so that sees the shift um, happen in, in age. So uh, you're 50% you're more likely to be doing an apprenticeship in your 30s than a school-based apprenticeship, most of which are traineeships. Um, and so um, I think that it, 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 the branding of Australian apprenticeships, a kind of a grab bag, doesn't help in that regard. And it doesn't reflect the fact that just uh, through the pandemic, that it was primarily a, a, a growth in traineeships that we saw. And since the end of boosting apprenticeship, it, it, it's been that decline. So that's uh, the types of um, uh, jobs that were on offer from employers. Um, and the other trend that's worth really noting uh, for women in trades, uh, where we're, as Peter said, we're coming from a very low level, um, but a lot of uh, women will start their apprenticeship in their 20s, having been in the workforce first and sort of got a bit battle hardened by some of the sexist attitudes that they encounter at school and in the school to work transition. They've always wanted to do an apprenticeship. When I talk to them, <laughs> to, a, to a lot of the these young women, they, they've always wanted to do it, but they're not prepared to uh, give it a go until they're in their mid 20s. Yeah, can I jump in as well? Um, I think one of the really interesting discussions that's, that's, you know, it's been going on for quite a while and I don't know where the momentum is going to end with this is around degree apprenticeships as well. And looking at apprenticeship as a model of work integrated learning rather than just something that's in the vocational sector. Um, and I think, you know, if we do expand out our degree apprenticeship offerings, and I know there are, you know, quite a number of programs going on at the moment um, to try and do this, that, you know, we are potentially looking at that integration of the vocational and higher education sectors. And, you know, how I think there's a question about how that could drive changes in perception. And it could also drive, um, you know, some of this uh, more gender equity in apprenticeships as well, um, particularly given that a lot of our more, um, I guess, vocational or work integrated learning higher education qualifications are female dominated um, and how there might be potential um, for some of those um, across a degree apprenticeship type model. Um, I think one of the interesting things, of course, you know, as, as both Ben and Adrian have said, um, the term traineeship um, coming under the banner of apprenticeships, but actually being the majority of what we would consider Australian apprenticeships is a really interesting um, discussion and status of a traineeship versus an apprenticeship as well. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the, the gendered lens that we uh, place on that or the, the equity lens that we place on traineeships as opposed to apprenticeships um, as well. I think there's a lot of work to do um, in the Australian culture to consider how we can talk about education and employment pathways in a much more equitable kind of manner. That That's interesting, Peter, because I've been associated with the development of a couple of higher apprentices in South Australia, in South Australia, mm -hmm. and um, they're in STEM areas. So once again, we've got a different gender lens happening because they're in uh, one was in um, a resources type discipline, and other ones in software engineering, which, mm -hmm. just as degree qualifications, have a gendered problems of themselves. So, you know, and I. And I also think that that word traineeship and apprentice, again, I chair the South Australian Apprenticeship Committee where we declare trades and vocations. And apprentice is still a status symbol. So some people want, don't want to call it a traineeship mm -hmm. because apprentice is status. And I, yeah, so we've got a ways to go. But I, I think there are opportunities in how we integrate mm -hmm. vet and higher ed. But, but higher ed's got its own participation patterns, mm. particularly when it comes to gender. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's so, an interesting. Think, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> just, just that term, I think, is interesting sorry. around. Sorry, that term higher as well, yeah. higher apprenticeships, higher education, mm. um, and how that pulls in. And just, sorry, looping back to one of Ben's comments as well, and, and Di would probably have a, um, something to say around this as well, um, is I know that there are some pilots going on to merge um, uh, electrical engineering degrees with um, electrical apprenticeships yeah. at the moment, um, and, you know, taking that cohort of participants um, who could go either pathway. But again, it is very much that kind of male-dominated lens. Yeah. I'll just let Diane um, have the last word because we've reached the end of our time already. But um, go um, ahead, Diane. Uh, well, look, e effectively, traineeships and apprenticeships are pathways to work. 
Um, and uh, we're seeing more um, university graduates come back to traineeships and apprenticeships as an entry, a foot in the door, getting into industry and um, finding the, the skills that they didn't receive whilst they're at university perhaps. But I think at, at a time of skills uh, skills crisis, what we need to do is really look, look at our untapped talent pools. This is what the report does. It's telling us the characteristics who are the people that aren't doing apprenticeships and traineeships and why? And some of the influence on the, um, the migrant population and the first generation um, population that aren't um, entering into apprenticeships, why is that? Um, and what cultural communities are they coming from? Uh, we know that um, in Europe, an, an apprenticeship um, pathway is upheld and quite um, part of the mainstream, but in other cultures, in other um, backgrounds, it, it, it's not, and it's not reinforced through the family line and so on. So where where are the cultural backgrounds of our migrants coming from? And um, is there an automatic flow and attraction to university um, for various reasons? So we have some work to do to uh, to um, to work on perhaps considering some targeted incentives, which do work for employers. When we have targeted incentives, we target groups and, um, and we can all work together to ensure that we reach those untapped talent pools and we change this 20-year arrangement of the same characteristics of um, apprentices um, signing up. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, and we um, thank you so much to the whole panel uh, today for um, raising some really interesting challenges and opportunities that we have in apprenticeship space. Um, you know, we've talked about moving from the broad policy strokes to maybe more specific interventions. Um, and I think from a research perspective, uh, the areas that I'm really keen to, to get delve into more are the student voice and the employer motivation, um, because we know that it's that, that um, partnership um, to, that, that makes it all work. So um, we didn't, we had that one question and Adrienne, you managed to pick up on it. So uh, well done. <laughs> and that, so that brings us to the end of our panel. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we have our National Vet Conference, No Frills, coming up on the 10th to 12th of July in Perth. So I'm very excited to be heading out west and look forward to seeing some of you there. And a short evalu online evaluation survey will be sent by email. And we'd appreciate if you take the time to provide feedback so we can improve your next experience with us. And we'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar, including Alice and the NCBR team behind the scenes who organised the event. And remember to stay connected with us through social media and on our website. Thank you.